Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on building and managing system products. My name is Nitz Jekinathan, and I'm a senior product manager at AWS. Before we dive into today's topic on uh, system product and what it is, I wanted to kind of give a background about my experience as a product manager and how my career transition uh, happened as a, from an engineer to a, a product manager. So my uh, progression has been uh, pretty straightforward from engineering to a PM, but um, it has been a slow one, and mainly because I was not clear exactly what I wanted to be doing uh, early on in my career. And as I gained more experience, it, it was, um, you know, it became apparent that product manager is the right fit for me. So I started out as a software engineer uh, in Wipro in 2004. And, um, you know, I, spent, I was usually writing C, C++ code as for drivers on the network systems uh, for telco companies. And then I felt that like, you know, I needed to gain more expertise in the side of systems engineering. So I came from a master's in electrical engineering from uh, University of Kentucky. And right out of college, I joined Intel, uh, Intel Labs as a systems researcher, focusing on next generation platforms and, um, you know, like mostly research on power management architecture and systems design. One of the things I realized, uh, I spent over five years in Intel Labs and, um, the thing I realized during that time is that the R&D cycle is pretty long. Right? Like one of the inventions from um, you know early on in my career, 2009, uh, made it into laptops in 2013, and I felt that that was a too long of a time uh, to make an impact. And I, so I wanted to be closer to the product. So I moved. Uh, I became a product architect in for laptop and the desktop team for a while. And I kind of gained different uh, perspectives on like all the other elements that go along uh, with being building a product. And I felt that like, uh, you know, I'd, only at that time I became aware of uh, product manager as a role. And I started transitioning towards a uh, product manager like about five years, um, you know, after I became a product architect. And um, and when I left, in, uh, when I left Intel, I was a um, lead product manager for the smart home team. A couple of products that you see below the Intel Speech Kit and the Deep Lens was part of that effort. And I joined AWS in 2019 as a product manager, and uh, I'm currently with the Snow Services team. And the Snow Service product, as you see down below, are ruggedized edge computing boxes where you can run cloud workloads at the disconnected and the rugged edge. So um, our team is always hiring and looking for talent. If this is a domain that you are interested in, you know, always feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and would love to talk with you. Now, I, one of the things I wanted to point out is that like when I started, we didn't have, um, you know, the same amount of resources on what is product management and what you need to be doing and skills that you need to acquire. But now with facilities such as product school, you have a lot more uh, you know, information at your disposal and like make use of that, if, uh, you know, like if that's of uh, an interest to you. All right, today we're gonna to be talking about system products, what they are, how do you plan for it, and you know how do you get approval, and things that you need to focus on during the development phase, uh, sustaining and like, um, you know, after you launch the product, what are the steps that you need to do to sustain it? And finally, we'll bring it all together with some key learnings. Okay. Let's start with the primer, right? What's the system product for the sake of this particular conversation? And then let's take it from there. For the sake of this particular uh, webinar, a system product is anything that has an electronic component in it. For instance, a smart lock, a smart coffee maker, a smart car, right? Anything that has the word smart in it has an electronic component of some, si uh, some sort. So it is in a system product. Um, so for instance, like if you take a smart lock, it's got like, you know, embedded systems in it. It has to have Bluetooth and like a security mechanism to ensure your application communicates to it securely and you can unlock it, right? So all of that requires coordination between hardware, software, firmware, and an application. And um, so that, that makes it a complex system product to manage. So what's unique about a system product, right? I don't always agree with Dwight, but in this case, he's right. Uh, with respect to a system product, because pivoting to something else from its original design is very hard, you have to be successful at the first attempt, right? Um, so for instance, like Slack started out as a, mess as a gaming platform and it became an enterprise messaging platform. You cannot do that with a system product more often than not, right? Uh, a coffee maker will always stay a coffee maker 
and you no matter what uh, smartness you add to it you know um, you, you cannot change it to something else so you have to be very clear uh, as a pm that like the product that you're building is meeting the customer's needs and it is or, and it is being operated in its uh, primary form of use all right uh, other things to consider usually anything that has hardware in it you know it's a long development cycle we are talking like you know one year is an aggressive timeline usually it takes longer than one year because you have you know the hardware team has to go scope out uh, what the architecture is go through multiple iterations and things like that so there is another key difference when compared to a software product is that like you know software product is built in an iterative manner and you have mechanisms to like you know release it periodically alpha beta and you can test out with mvp with the customers and iterate so you are showing progress along the way uh, that you are continuous, continually, you know, heading towards the goal. With respect to hardware product, right, uh, or a system product in this case, you don't actually deliver anything to the customer till it is finally ready. So it might mean up to a year, or a year and a half of no deliverables to the customer. And so that makes it a little harder from a PM point of view that you have to keep communicating with both the management level as well as with the rest of the teams on where you are progressing, what the blockers are, what your current goalpost is. So the communication is key uh, from a PM point of view. And another thing uh, is that like, you know, system teams are usually multidisciplinary. It, it, and it is by nature, you, uh, you know, usually a larger team because you have to consider multiple software, hardware and firmware teams. And then you have to consider mechanical, industrial design, uh, packaging, legal, uh, accounting, and then like, you know, thermal teams have to be involved and finally like user experience, which ties in a lot of those things together. Uh, so from a management point of view, because you have multiple stakeholders, uh, all of the streams needs to be managed and any blockers needs to be mitigated. This brings to the point to the left that we are, any system product development is gonna require a large upfront uh, capital expense. You have to put in millions of dollars to your ODM. First of all, the ODMs have to agree to build it, and and you have to have the timeline that matches with their plans. And then you also have to pay money to make sure that they have the assembly line free, and you have to pay for the labor and packaging, testing, uh, compliance. All of that requires money, right? So you have to have uh, show the value proposition that like building this product is going to you know provide much larger uh, you know, monetary gain to the organization than otherwise, which is why like system products are almost always a core competency for a, for a particular company. If a company is not used to building system products, uh, you know, like uh, getting and venturing into a system uh, product where, you know, area is always challenging. As you may have surmised, right? Um, iterative development on the system level is going to be hard. For, uh, for instance, let's take a car, right? Like, so when a, when a car walk, you know, goes out of the parking lot, it needs to have the minimum set of capabilities uh, from a system point of view. There are value-added services, like you, know, or you can change the audio firmware, like you know, uh, for instance, the camera firmware and stuff like that. But the core foundational uh, specifications of the car needs to be there the first time it rolls out. But you do have the uh, you know ability to iterate over generations. For instance, like consider the first iPod. It had those uh, you know like uh, wheel that you had. It had no display and it was you know quite bulky. And over a period of years, you know they you add they are, you know Apple added an, uh, an LCD screen, a touch screen. It had the ability to zoom in. They added Bluetooth. And finally, when it ended up in an iPod Touch, it was almost similar to a, you know, like a smartphone in capability. So you can always iterate and improve your product over like many generations, but each one of those generations, like, you know, you have uh, certain constraints that you have to adhere to. All right, so finally, right, like, so we, all those constraints, cons uh, you know, considering all of those constraints that I mentioned, why are we building the system products then? Right. Uh, it's because um, if you look at the physical manifestation of all the uh, you know, products that are around us, almost all of them are evolving into some kind of a smarter device. Your refrigerators are becoming smarter, your microwave oven is smarter now, like you know, uh, so are like washing machines and 
all the ones which are physical, just physical mechanical things are now becoming uh, electronic components. The reason for doing that is that uh, you know you're uh, you're bringing in more value, and they are all networked, and it 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 simplifies customers' experience of managing them, and uh, you know building uh, you know building those brand loyalty. For instance, if you're building uh, you know like a computer platform, customers keep that for like about like four to five years, and it started to push towards six years. During those six years, you have the customer's mind share. You can sell additional services on top, and they have more familiar with your ecosystem. And as you start adding more services, you know your wall, your your solution becomes a walled garden, and customer continues to look for that same kind of um, you know platform again and again. Like for instance, uh, between the Windows ecosystem, the uh, Apple ecosystem, and the Android ecosystem, you can see that people who are more familiar with a certain ecosystem continue to look out for the same uh, kind of products. Right, so that builds a lasting brand loyalty, and also it builds a moat. Customers' data, once it is in a specific, uh, you know, like a walled garden, they don't want to move around. Right? So I think having that um, platform keeps the customer engaged for a long period of time. So then now you can start focusing on how do I bring in more value uh, so that like customers stay in that. And you can extract most mileage out of the customers, um, you know, like mindshare. All right, so we have we have talked about some of the uniqueness of uh, the system product side. Now we are going to be talking about like how how do you plan for these products? What are uh, so that like you know you can have the right set of metrics that you can convince the leadership that uh, investing on it is the right idea. A system product at high level has like you know three layers, right? You have the services and you have the system software, which includes the OS kernels, drivers the firmware, the BIOS, uh, the EC that's on the platform, and then the hardware itself, right? So the, each of them have different levels of iterations possible. Like hardware has the lowest level of iteration and it starts very early. So you have to, uh, you know, set the specifications to, uh, uh, maybe you start with the very high level specifications and then you quickly narrow down to the key elements that you need. For instance, whether you need Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, uh, other radios and uh, you know like things like that needs to be settled so early on so that you can set the appropriate system software right and system software you do have the ability to iterate a little bit more you for instance you might have started out with ubuntu 20, uh, 18 as your uh, you know initial launching uh, os but by the time it gets towards the launch you can potentially say like i'm going to move to 20 because it's got the latest security features it supports python 3 for instance and stuff like that on the services layer, you have a lot more uh, degrees of freedom. You can iterate a lot more. Uh, you know, you can launch the product, and as long as there is a mechanism to update your uh, firmware and system software and services, you can always push over the air updates. Mm -hmm. So thinking about this in different, uh, you know, different layers and where you can iterate more and where you cannot helps you plan for it depending on which planning cycle you are. Early on, I focus more on hardware and setting the right specs and then system software next, and then the services, the last. All right, the product planning for a system product is very similar to that of a software system as well. Uh, I think there are just a few things to take into account is that because it's a, uh, you know, a physical product, you will have to put something in front of the customer that, that is a representative of your final product and then get feedback from there. Right. And you have very um, smaller number of iterations here because your hardware team needs to finalize uh, all the mechanical and industrial and thermal needs. So you don't have the luxury of continuously gathering feedback. Like for instance, like, you know, continuous discovery, which Teresa Torres is talking about. You don't have that capability uh, with respect to a uh, system product. Uh, from a competitive lens, if here it's more a strategic element, right? You're always, almost always customer uh, centric, but uh, you also keep an eye on the competitive lens and help saw, you know, set some of the baselines uh, easily. For instance, if you have a product and there is a, you know, like a comparative product in the market, you don't need to validate every single element. You can kind of like know what customers are familiar with and set those baseline specifications, which might include the CPU, the memory, uh, you know, like the form factor size and things like that. 
And then you can focus on the core, um, you know, like areas that are important to you. And that, that differentiates your product as well. So, you know, spending more time on things that are, that are differentiating to your product is more valuable to you than trying to focus on things that are not differentiated. And the one other piece, which is very critical to a uh, system product compared to a software one is the customer commitment, right? Because you are asking for upfront capital, your leadership needs to see that where does this product run in the market? So you have to go talk to your customers, identify your segments, where your, who are your key customers' uh, personas, and see whether you can actually like get uh, customers to pay for them. Essentially with the MOUs or whether it's purchase orders from large retail places like Costco or Target. So having those kind of, uh, you know, like uh, purchase orders, agreements of some kind, almost always justifies the need to uh, invest money upfront. Right. I, I touched upon the user testing a little uh, in the previous slide. So essentially, our life has gotten much easier with the 3D printing capability. So in the past, you almost always had a foam or a cardboard mockup of your particular product, and the interaction with it was not exactly like you know matching. And so, you, what you can do now is you can print out uh, 3D print your form factor in multiple different shapes. Uh, different screen sizes, for instance, and get an accurate feedback from customers, look and feel the weight, does it match with the customer's estimation? And you can, you know, you can estimate that into your final specification. I think the key point, as I mentioned before, is that you do not have too many iterations of this. So you can do potentially like one or two or three cycles maybe, right? but you don't, you cannot do this throughout the life of your product. You have to do this early on in the planning phase so that like you know your specifications are set your dimensions are set so that the mechanical team the industrial design team and the user experience team all of them know what they are expecting and start working on the actual implementation of it and the competitive lens is also another thing we talked about like if, for instance if you are a pm uh, for the first generation iphone you don't actually go and like validate all the all the basic uh, requirements, right? You can look at your competitive product, in this case, an N95 series. They have a color display, they have a front-facing camera, and then they had LED for like brighter uh, pictures and a central button to manage your calls. They potentially had touch, uh, touch but it was more resistive touch than uh, capacitive touch. But I think that is the key point is that you can, you know, uh, the basic call quality requirements that was expected, the battery life, the, you know, the durability of the product. So you can try to, uh, you know, like collect all of those metrics and add your system spec very easily. And that frees up the time for you to go focus on the value added piece. In this case, for an iPhone, essentially the app ecosystem and the usability of the product, right? So once you have, uh, you know, Time is a precious resource for PMs as for everybody else. So focusing on the right elements with respect to your system product is going to be the key. Don't waste time uh, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel on things that you can easily collect from uh, the marketplace. Focus on the things where the marketplace is not giving you that feedback. So this is a very critical piece for um, system product and it's becoming more and more apparent uh, to me by looking at uh, you know our current list of offerings everywhere is that you need to add value added services onto your product like think of your product as a platform and which stays with the customer for a long period of time and like if you can add value added services on top of your product you have the ability to increase your overall net margin for your product as a whole and it also helps de-risk your hardware development cost for instance, like consider this coffee maker, right? A Curie coffee maker usually sits on your kitchen. It does its job of like, you know, brewing coffee for you every day. But on the, uh, now if you add a service of uh, a smart auto delivery of like, you know, different flavored coffee cups to you, uh, you're first, you're adding more value to the customer. Now customer is like, you know, has a better experience using your product, but and on, from your point of view, you are actually bringing in more revenue to your overall business line. And because your service, pro service product always has, you know, better margins than a system product, your overall net margin improves. 
Uh, another case in, case point is that um, you know Apple, for instance, they have like multiple ecosystem of physical products, Mac, uh, you know the Mac for iPhones and the smartwatches, and their services line, which includes the iTunes and like you know the app ecosystem, brings in about twenty percent of the revenue. That twenty percent with high margins actually helps them subsidize their um, you know hardware manufacturing and helps them maintain the high bar with respect to the uh, you know, physical de uh, device manufacturing. So almost always think about uh, any value added services that you can bring to the customer onto your platform. So now you have completed the product planning and you have gotten approval from your leadership. And you know, from a PM point of view, this is a critical phase where you have to actually put them all together and make sure that it works as per your plan. From a product development point of view, uh, you have to manage multiple streams because system products, as I mentioned, is a multidisciplinary effort, right? And it's a long period of time uh, to manage that. And uh, so from, a, I remember at one point when I was managing a system product, there were like 20 different work streams. Like imagine in a software side, you have the OS, you have the kernel, uh, you have the uh, driver team, and then you have the SDK and you have the applications layer and services teams that you have to interact with. And you have the hardware team, the firmware, uh, buyers, EC. So you, you can imagine like 20, 25 uh, streams that you have to uh, you know, continuously keep track. The, the key elements that you have to uh, focus on is that like, you, know, you start with a developer platform, uh, dev board of some kind, and then you use the EVT, uh, which is the eval kit, where all the hardware, software, and firmware comes together, do, do some initial testing. And then the DVT comes in, which is the developer platform, which has all the developer extensions to it. And then finally, the PVT is a representation of your final product. And this is where you integrate all your uh, base software, hardware, and firmware are making, uh, working together. And you know, if any issues are uncovered at this stage, you have to go back and go fix them. And because after this point, any change to your hardware or your system is actually gonna be very expensive. Right? So a PVT exit is gonna be a key milestone for you to track. And you will have, uh, you know, other stuff like mechanical, thermals, uh, compliance, packaging. So there is, uh, you can imagine like 15, 20 streams easily. And from when I was managing, a, a, you know, like system products like this, usually you run like a weekly or a bi-weekly cadence meeting with different stakeholders and identify potential blockers and, you know, I, you know identify different mitigation steps. And you also need to communicate to leadership where you are progressing along your path, right? And that's going to be the key because your team needs that visibility on where you are going and how you are doing. And so does your leadership. And because you don't have any, you know, like customer facing deliverable for a, at least a year, you have to do this uh, proactively. All right. So I wanted to touch upon compliance because it's a little bit, you know, it goes under the radar, uh, but it, it has an impact on your schedule and your planning, right? You cannot ship a device into a country without getting uh, compliance certificates from that, if it's a system product, right? All electronic components needs to be fully tested. And the reason for doing that is that like, you know, our devices are fundamentally noisy with respect to electromagnetic radiation. And we are, you know, all the devices are radiating energy and they have to be within a specification so that like you don't cause physical harm to somebody who's has, a, let's say for instance, a heart maker and like too much interference, you know, interferes with that device. Uh, sorry, pacemaker. I mean. um, so essentially like, you know, you, USA has the FCC. Without getting FCC's compliance, you will not be able to ship a product to USA, a production product. Same thing for Canada, CE from, for European Union, and that's a different ball game altogether. Japan requires that like you have to do the testing in their country using their lab, right? And those are just the compliance for electromagnetic interference. But then there is the safety standards, which is the UL to make sure that you're not using unsafe chemicals on your product and ROHAS to ensure that you're not using products that are fund foundationally damaging to the environment. Um, so almost always you will be using a third party for this third party who specializes in compliance and they take your product, run through compliance. And the, the big issue is that if they do identify a potential issue, 
you have to go back and like uh, you know come back with uh, steps to mitigate it like in case like uh, if you ever wondered what this big uh, cylindrical blob that is attached to your wire those are called ferrite chokes and their primary purpose is to reduce high frequency noise on the uh, cables so think of your cables as giant antennas that's radiating all electromagnetic signals so you add these ferrite chokes to attenuate those signals so that like your system is compliant any system that you are sending a you know a system that has a charger a battery your compliance complications have increased significantly so you need to plan for it from the beginning this is not something that you can uh, add on to your product later on compliance needs to be foremost if you are actually like launching a product anywhere another element is the packaging side you, you know usually we don't talk about it but all of us experience this on a you know like a regular basis and this has an impact on customers experience because this is the first thing they get to encounter and it also is a passionate uh, effort of mine is like you know to we need to reduce uh, single use plastic in our packaging because it grinds my gears for instance on the right hand side like the lego pieces there are like a zillion single use plastic bags where you put like another small uh, plastic parts in there and and immediately after you open the packaging you discard all of those plastic and they end up in a landfill on the other hand like you know look at like ipad um the seventh generation ipad which i recently bought they had i counted like one single use plastic that was around the charger everything else was cardboard or recyclable parts and no matter how nice of a finish it is you're still going to throw away the packaging uh, so i would say like as pms we have to raise the bar on ecologically sound and sensitive uh, you know like product packaging for us of course any time you go into like you know non plastic related packaging mechanisms it almost always adds cost right but then um, you know you, there are there are other avenues for recuperating that than uh, you know using single use plastics that are potentially damaging to the environment okay so finally you know you have done with the development it's been a year and a half since you started it you got the approval you have provided all the updates to the leadership your product is ready to go to the market right so what we think uh, what everyone thinks we do versus what we really do will be totally different because at the time of launch you know you have to make sure that like the customers are able to order the devices uh, on the day of the launch and your key customers have prior access with respect to private previews or betas so that you get uh, you know early feedback on how your product is doing and any things that you can fix you can focus on fixing them so not just with on the day of the launch you will have to coordinate with the event coordinators the product marketing the sales team so that like all your funnel is primed so it's a lot of activity from a pm point of view the main one is that like you have to tell your manufacturers how many devices that you need at the day of the launch and where they are going to be stored so that like if anybody is ordering you know on the day of the launch they look at your announcement you have you make sure that they can get a device because you want to you want to get early adopters devices and then they can use that to spread word of the mouth good media coverage and all of that and you have to plan this months in advance you start with the launch date work backwards and say identify how much lead time it is to manufacture a part and then like you know work with the odms give them the appropriate amount of uh, manufacturing guidance and you know like essentially making sure that the entire process is tracked as you can imagine you have to do all of this while you are planning a product development may with multiple uh, things that you are tracking things can fall through the crack uh, so almost always uh, you know planning for product launch ahead of time is going to make sure that you have a successful launch while the product launch and development phase is almost you know it feels rewarding on the day of the launch it almost feels like you have uh, you had a big accomplishment from your point of view as well as the team's point of view the sustaining of a product and scaling it with customers is a lot harder and it is also like a, you know it goes on for years right um as a pm our job is to kind of look into our crystal ball and estimate where how much how the product is going to be doing in the market you have a certain estimates on how many customers are going to be buying at the day of the launch one month in three months in you know like 12 months in and you have to give those numbers to your manufacturing partners and also to your logistics team 
because they have to store these devices and they have to ship them to the customer. And so it, it, uh, if you are wrong in either direction, there is implications. Like for instance, like let's say you project like 50,000 units on the day of the launch and all of a sudden there is 100,000 customers who want to buy it. You can only fill 50,000 orders and then the remaining 50,000 customers uh, they will have to wait uh, till new parts can be manufactured, which is a good problem to have, but except for the current circumstances where like the lead time to procure uh, silicon components is like up to two years these days. Like there are entire automobile factories who are not uh, running because there are no silicon parts, right? So meaning your 50,000 customers who are who placed an order on the launch day, they might actually have to wait up to a year, right? depending on which product that you're building. So they are, this has made uh, uh, you know, life as a product manager very hard. So if you are wrong in one side, uh, you will completely lose customer uh, you know, like, uh, mind share because they will, they will not wait for a year or a, maybe even two years for that place. On the flip side to that is that if you are overly optimistic and customer demand is not there, you have this volume of inventory that is sitting in your warehouse and depreciating on a daily basis. And that hits your bottom line. So we have, as a PM, we have to walk this narrow line and we also almost always have this 20 to 30% scope of going up or down. Uh, so that like, you know, if, if it goes above that window or below that window, you I can you can adjust the uh, uh, materials, right? So for instance, like I, I think the perfect example would be like Amazon launched Kindle in 2007 and the original Kindle sold off in, I think it's 2004, I believe. Uh, the original Kindle sold off uh, in five hours, right? And then the customer had to wait for like at least like, you know, six weeks before they can get the other one. On the other hand, when Amazon launched the Fire Phone in 2014, they had like projected like, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of devices and like customers were not coming in. And their, you know, the optimistic look was, sorry, the pessimistic look was even, uh, you know, much lower than that they had to write up 140 million, $170 million of inventory in six months after launch. So you have to be walking the tight rope of between like being, uh, you know, adjusting between like optimistic and pessimistic and continuously adjusting your signals. And, I, and there is another thing is that like after, let's say like after a year of your product launch, your adoption will hit a steady state and like after a while, like it starts dropping. So you have to keep giving signals uh, to your ODM so that like your device volumes are appropriate. Okay, so um, this is another piece where like anytime you are planning for uh, devices, they need to be stored somewhere and they need to be uh, you know shipped to the customer. That's one side, that's the forward side. You have to look at the end to end. What happens from the time the customer places the order to the time when the customer receives the, uh, you know, product and vice versa also like what happens if the customer is not happy for whatever reason the system is broken they ship it back to you you have to store it and you have to either repair it or restock it recycle it so there is you know the forward and the reverse logistics is something that you have to plan uh, ahead of time this is not something you uh, you know you you can jump up on it after you launch a product this has to be planned from uh, you know the first early uh, definitions of your system architecture you will know how much, uh, what will be the, you know, like space that your product will be taking. So you will know how much warehouse space uh, you will need for the time of launch and your peak and, you know, potentially like look for labor costs and account for all of this in your pricing model. So this is gonna, you know, essentially like it depends on industry, on the, on the computer industry, you usually take 20% of your inventory. It's pretty, I mean, it's, it's still very high. You can assume like up to 20% of your inventory can be returned from the customers or repaired or recycled or broken for that matter, right? And you have to assume if it's cars or like, you know, industries that is well established, it's less than 2% or something, uh, you know, it depends on which industry it is, but almost always accounting for forward and reverse logistics into your, uh, you know, pricing model and your p &L is going to be the key. So, this is um, the last file that I have is that like, you know, as your product is in the hands of the customers, they are going to be keep, uh, they're going to be like, you know, interacting with it. You are going to be getting feedback, both positive and negative. And as a PM, our job is to continuously curate them, right? 
you can imagine where uh, you know Steve is coming from here because like they spend millions of I mean billions of dollars almost with thousands of people working on this product and customers are holding this device in a very specific way and the call attenuation I mean the antenna attenuation increases and the call drops and it's you know it is a very specific problem only if you hold it in one particular way so now what do you do to tell your customers is like just don't hold it like that right like because is it a blocker for the customer as a, or is it a nice to have? But I mean, to Apple's credit, they have taken that feedback and they continuously fixed it. So but iPhone 5 didn't have the same problem. They made different antenna choices. Um, so I think that's the, you know, like an evolving job from a, a you know, product manager point of view for managing your product. Collect feedback, curate them continuously, identify which are blockers, which are not blockers. Things there are, there may be things that you may be able to fix in software. There are things you may not be able to fix in software. Those are system dependent. You focus on iterating on next generation. But overall, like maintaining and curating this list is a foundational job for a PM. All right. So finally, let's just bring it all together with some key learnings that we have learned during this particular webinar. System products require months of upfront planning and alignment from leadership, right? You need to make sure that your leadership is fully aware of why you are building it and what's your potential benefit and like how many services that you're going to be adding to your platform and things like that. And what's your you know, net margin, profit opportunity, everything. And you also have to spend months ahead of time with respect to user testing, you know, like who your key target customers are, competitive environment, all of that. And PMs have to think critically forward and backwards about your product, meaning what happens from the time the customer places the order to the uh, time when it is received by the customer and what happens if they are not happy, they're returning it back. You have to have uh, logistics manage everything. So the number three, I think we, it's very clear um, is that like you, you are, once the specs are finalized, any deviation in plan is expensive, mainly on the system side. Right. Anything that involves the hardware, OS, firmware, changing them is much harder. As you and the services side, you know, you have a lot more freedom uh, to kind of adjust them around. So making sure that you are building the right thing and setting the specifications early on is going to be the key. And finally, uh, we didn't have a chance to discuss a lot, uh, but focus on the things that you control tightly, uh, you know, and you're you're keeping the eye on it. For, for example, as PMs, we manage the product usability. You can absolutely almost always control that to a tighter extent than to a system specifications for that matter. Like product packaging is another one, right? There are things that we have more control and focus on that and focus on how you can use that to improve the customer's experience on your product. With that, uh, I conclude today's webinar. It was always great talking to you. And if you have any questions, almost, uh, you know, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you.